This is section 2.2, the limit of a function, and our first objective is to understand and use limit notation in a variety of formats. The language objective is I'd like you to explain the connection between a limit of a function and the function's y-coordinates on the graph. Before we can accomplish this objective, we need to be familiar with the vocabulary and the notation that you're going to encounter. So the three words are very closely linked. We have limit, right-hand limit, and left-hand limit. And we have some notation that goes with all three of those. The first would be read the limit of f of x as x approaches a equals l. And we say this if the y values on the function get closer and closer to l, as close as we want it to be, when x approaches a from both sides. Now one thing that is very critical about these limits is that we do not care what is happening at a. We only want to get close to a and see if something nice is happening with the y coordinates. So once we understand that, then we can start talking about the right hand limit and the left hand limit. This one says, what are the y values getting close to as x approaches a from the right hand side? And in this case, the answer would be l because the values of the function's outputs are getting closer and closer to l as we put in values that are closer and closer to a but larger than a. Left hand limit means we're coming toward a from the left hand side. So we're dealing with numbers that are smaller than a plugging them into f and hoping that we're getting closer and closer to this value of l. Now personally when I saw these for the first time I got really confused. The notation was strange thinking about getting arbitrarily close to things but not equal to things. It was just a hard concept. It will make a lot more sense if we think about it graphically and we read what this is really saying. So I have two illustrations here that will hopefully help it make more sense. The first is we have this graph of a parabola and I'm interested in knowing what the y coordinates are getting close to as x approaches 2 from either side. We can look at it on the picture or we can look at it in a chart of data. If we look here we can see that x starts out smaller than 2 and then those values of x are getting larger and larger and closer and closer to 2 from the left hand side. We can also see that the corresponding y coordinates are getting closer and closer to 4. So graphically what's happening is we started to the left of 2, we hopped on the curve and we were looking to see what's happening with those y coordinates. As the x's got closer and closer to 2, the y coordinates were getting closer and closer to 4. So we could write down that the left hand limit or the limit as x approached 2 from the left hand side was equal to 4. Now if we look at the other side of our chart, we see that we're starting with a value of x that is larger than 2, and then we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller and closer and closer to 2 from the right hand side. Again, we see that those outputs or the y coordinates are getting closer and closer to 4. Graphically, if we locate that 2, move to the right, hop up on the curve and then move along the curve until we're directly over 2, we see that the y values were getting closer and closer to 4. So we could write the limit as x approaches 2 from the right hand side of f of x is also equal to 4. Now because both the left and the right y values were getting close to the same number, we can say that the two-sided limit as x approaches 2 from either side is also going to be 4. For our second illustration, this kind of drives home the fact that we don't care what's happening at a. If we look at this graph here, I plugged a into the function and I got l out, which is why this point is on the graph of the curve. When I hop on the curve to the left or the right of a and then move toward a, for the x value, I can see from both sides that the y values are getting close to l. But notice that that exact same thing happens on this curve and on this curve. Because we don't care what's happening at a, we can say in all three of these scenarios that the limit as we approach a from both sides on that function is going to equal l. So 
a when we plug it into the function could equal l or a when we plug it into the function doesn't work because a is not in the domain or a can be plugged into the function and yield a different y-coordinate than the limit but all three of these will still have the same limit so I'd like you now to explain the connection between the limit of a function and the functions y-coordinates on the graph there is a connection but I want you to be able to articulate it you will be expected to work with limits in a variety of formats so the first one is going to be what we see here in example one where you are provided the picture and asked to read limit information off of it so it helps if you can interpret this as a question this says what are my y coordinates getting close to as x approaches 6 from the right hand side so to answer this question we will locate the 6 move to the right, hop up on the curve, and then drag along the curve until we are directly over or below that x value of 6. When we do that, we now ask ourselves, what is the y coordinate getting close to? And we see that it is 7. This part B says, what are the y coordinates getting close to as x approaches 6 from the left hand side? So again, we start at 6, move to the left, hop up on the curve, travel along the curve until we are close to an x value of 6 and then we look to see what's that y value getting close to. Again it is 7. Because these two numbers are the same that means the two-sided limit will also be 7 because no matter which side we come from the y values are approaching that same 7. If we look at part D now it says what are the y values getting close to as x approaches 3 from the right? So we locate 3, we move to the right, hop up to the curve, and then travel along the curve until we're over 3. And while we're traveling, we ask ourselves, what y coordinate are we getting close to? And in this case, it is a 4. Next one, what are the y coordinates getting close to as x approaches 3 from the left? If I locate 3, go to the left, hop on the curve, and then move along the curve till I'm over 3, we see in this case that the y coordinate is getting closer and closer to 3. Because these two numbers do not match, that means there's no single number that the y coordinates are getting close to as x approaches 3 from both sides. And for that reason, we can say that the two-sided limit does not exist. What I want to emphasize with this example is that the limit of f of x as x approaches a from both sides will equal l if and only if the right-hand limit and the left-hand limit are the same and they're both equal to l. If either one of these mess up or if they go to separate places, this two-sided limit will not exist. Example 2 is a little more challenging than example 1 because rather than getting the graph and then answering limit questions, we are given limit statements and from those statements we have to generate the graph. So what that means is again we have to interpret what this means graphically. This says the y coordinates are getting closer and closer to 4 as the x coordinates approach 3 from the right. That means buried in here we have an ordered pair where x is 3 and y is 4. So I can go to the graph over 3 and up 4 and draw a circle. I don't know what's actually happening at 3 because limit statements only tell me what's happening near 3. And because I have this little plus here, I'm getting information about what's happening to the right of this point. It tells me that if I move along the curve, I'm going to run into that circle if I'm coming from the right side. The next statement says, as I approach 3 from the left-hand side now, the y-coordinates are getting closer and closer to 2. So again, we have the point 3, 2 that is buried in here, and I'm approaching that point from the left-hand side. The next statement says, the y-coordinates are approaching 2 when x gets closer and closer to negative 2 from both sides. So buried in this, we have the point negative 2, 2, and this time I've got curve coming off both sides. The next two are actual point information. This says when I plugged 3 into the function, I got 3 out. So I would have the ordered pair 3, 3 on the graph, and I will plot it as a point. 
The next one says, when I plug negative 2 in, I got a 1 out. So again, I have the point negative 2, positive 1. The final statement says the domain of f is all real numbers. That means I can't have any gaps in the picture. I've got to have a y-coordinate for every single x-coordinate that I see. So I accomplish that by simply connecting all the little tails that are hanging off of these circles. Once I have all the pieces and parts connected, then I double check to make sure that I have a function and that I pass the vertical line test. And at no point do I cross more than one y coordinate, so I know that I am good. With example three now, I give you a piecewise function and ask you to compute limits. And one of the ways that you will approach this is to graph the piecewise function. For those of you who don't remember how to do this, we essentially have three branches. So we could graph an x squared curve, that parabola opening up with the vertex at 0, 0. We have a line with a slope of 1 and a y-intercept of negative 2. And then we have another parabola that opens up and has been moved down 4 units. Now we can't have all three of these graphed in their entirety because we wouldn't have a function. It would fail the vertical line test. So what we do instead is we pay attention to what x-coordinates are involved when we're on this graph. So because x needs to be smaller than 0 in order to be on this parabola, we would graph the parabola and connect our dots, and we get to be on this as long as we're to the left of that vertex 0, 0. The next piece, which is the line, we get to be on between 0 and 2. And we notice that we have these equal signs here, which means we get to include the endpoints. The final piece, which is the trickiest one, is this x squared minus 4. It's a parabola that has its vertex at 0, negative 4, and it opens up, but we don't get to get on it until 2. Now that we have the picture, it turns into an example 1 problem, and we just have to ask ourselves, what are the y coordinates getting close to as x behaves in certain ways? So for this one, we say, what are the y coordinates getting close to as x approaches 0 from the left-hand side? And we can locate 0, move to the left, hop on the curve, and then travel along the curve and ask, oh, look, those y coordinates are getting close to 0. If we come from the right-hand side now, we again will locate 0, move to the right, hop on the curve, travel along the curve until the x coordinate is 0, and see that the y coordinates are getting close to negative 2. Because these two do not match, Match, we end up not having a limit for the function when x approaches 0 from both sides. We can see that very quickly because we have a gap or a jump at x equals 0. And if I were to put my thumbs on the graph and come from the left and the right, my thumbs would not meet. So when I have this kind of jump, we're never going to have a two-sided limit. If we look at d, we want to know what are the y values getting close to as x approaches 2 from the left. So here's my 2. I move to the left. I travel along the curve, and I see that I'm getting closer and closer to a y value of 0. If I do the same thing, coming toward 2 from the right, I locate 2, move to the right, hop on the curve, travel along the curve toward an x value of 2, and I see that my y values, again, are getting closer and closer to 0. Because these two match, the two-sided limit will also be 0. With example 4 now, our goal is to compute limits using our calculators. So to do so, we first need to turn on our calculator and access our y editor, because we're going to duplicate what we've done graphically simply by creating a graph on our calculators. So in y1, we're going to put the function. Notice the function is this x minus 1 divided by an x squared minus 1. Be careful that you put in your parentheses. And what's nice about the 89 is it has the pretty print, so we can see that we indeed put it in correctly. Now while I'm here, I'm going to put in the second function, so that I don't have to do it later. And a feature that's built in is 
we want to first look at just this limit. So we want to graph just this function. And currently I have check marks on both y1 and y2. If I only want to look at y1, I need to somehow turn off this one. So I arrowed up to make it black, and then I look along the top, and I see that f4 has that little check mark. So if I come here to f4, I can turn it off, and now y1 is the only one that will be graphed. If I now graph it, notice that on my 84s, I would probably want to do a zoom standard or a zoom 6. And typically on the 84s, all that graphing stuff that you needed was right along the top in these buttons. Well, the TI-89 is a significantly more powerful calculator, so they can't afford to designate just one feature to each button. So what they've done instead is when you are in a particular environment, these buttons up here will stand for what they used to stand for on the TI-84s. So here, where Zoom used to be at this location, it's still going to be there when we're in the graphing mode. So because we want Zoom, we can see up here that F2 is representing the Zoom. So if I zoom standard, we can see the graph of our function from part A. Now our goal is to figure out what are the y coordinates getting close to as x approaches 1 from both sides. Well, you might be tempted to trace, which remember was right here on your 84, and it's still going to be there when we're in this mode. So we hit F3, you might be tempted to trace to 1. Well, if you do that, there's nothing showing up in the y-coordinate. And the reason that happens is that 1 is not in the domain of the function. When I plugged 1 in, I got division by 0, which is not allowed. So because of that, I have to think about the limit. Remember, we don't care what's happening at 1. We just want to get close to 1. So if I trace, say, to 1.00001, we can see that that y-coordinate is getting awfully close to a half. And because I want to come from both sides, I also need to come at it from 0.99999. Again, I'm awfully close to a half. So based on what's happening graphically, we can see that that limit is going to be 0.5. I now want to look at the next one. I go back to my calculator, go back to the Y editor, and turn that one back on by using F4, and then arrow up and turn off Y1. Because this one has trig in it, I probably want to zoom with a trig window. I also want to reiterate, if I haven't already, that in calculus, the angle measures that you work with will always be measured in radians. So if this doesn't say radian right now, you need to change it, and you need to keep it that way. So to fix that, if it doesn't say radian, you go to Mode, and right here where it says Angle, you will arrow down, and then arrow over, and make sure radian is the one that is selected. When it's black, hit enter, hit enter again, double check that you're in radian mode, and then hit zoom 7 for the zoom trig window. Here comes our function, and again we want to trace. If we trace to 0, we see that it's not in the domain, but if we trace close to 0 on the right, we get a y value awfully close to 1, and if we trace close to 0 on the left, we again get a y value awfully close to 1. So that means over here, we can write down that that limit is 1. Now what I'd like you to do before you put your stuff away is make sure you summarize what we did to compute the limit on our calculator, because there's nothing in your notes here. I just showed you, and we didn't write anything down. So take 30 seconds to write down the process so that when you come back to this when you're studying for the tests or for the AP in the spring, you'll have something to refer back to.